Deep in the Gulf of Carpentaria, mangrove forests, which should be the nurseries of top-end fisheries, have turned to dust. These are long bums. As you can see, they normally in the under the trees, but they're dying. Mara traditional owner Patsy Evans alerted the Northern Territory government in 2015 that a thousand kilometres of mangroves were dying. Oh, this is bad. Worse, unbelievable. Can't even believe what's happening. This is clearly looks like, from the analysis we've done, an extreme series of, of events, moisture, temperature, salinity. The very fact that four years after this mangrove die-off, the devastation here is still utter, shows that in the top end, we're really on the front line of severe climate change impacts now. We can't see any other driver of dieback, or of, of the dieback at that scale, other than the extreme climatic envelope has shifted. Scientists are predicting the already hot, humid top end will continue to get hotter. Currently Darwin, for example, gets about 11 days a year over 35 degrees. Under a sort of a business as usual scenario, that could increase by 2090 to, to, to a, an average of 265 days. 50 kilometres off the Darwin coast on Bear Sand Island, scientist Mick Guinea is studying how warming is changing the sex of baby flat pack turtles as they incubate. One of her eggs? Yeah, I'll oh, better, better put it back better in. Better put it back in, yes. Yep. Mick Guinea says if sand temperatures continue to rise each year on Bear Sand Island, by 2030 all the turtles born here will be female. Once the temperatures rise to 34 degrees, then the eggs will no longer be uh, able to hatch and that this population will become extinct. I wasn't expecting to see extinctions in, in my lifetime. On Darwin's Casharina Beach, Stephen Garnett has analysed buried shells and sand to study the rate at which sea level rise is scarring the coast away. This is stuff that's been buried here for 1,400 years, untouched. And then in the last 15 years, that whole front dune has disappeared. The top end is experiencing sea level rise at twice the rate of southern Australia and the global average. Because north of here we've got the Arafura Sea, which lies on top of the continental shelf, so it's very shallow, so it warms up very quickly. The expansion of the warmer shallow seas of northern Australia will contribute to sea level rise that's predicted to inundate several of Darwin's coastal suburbs by 2050. It's not just coastal areas that will be affected by the rise of sea levels. 150 kilometres inland, 50% of Kakadu's low-lying, bird-life and fish-rich freshwater wetlands will be inundated by 2050. There's just no way that these animals can adapt um, genetically in, in, at the pace that this change is likely to occur. We've already seen it happening. Climate change is also expected to strengthen top-end cyclones and storm surges. Some scientists are saying we now need a Category 6 um, to account for what is projected for the future. Scientists now know they've underestimated how much sea levels will be raised by polar ice cap melting. Most scientists think that they've been too conservative with their projections. The CSIRO estimates even if the global Paris emissions reduction targets are met, it won't be enough to halt these changes. If countries of the world do want to reduce emissions to two degrees or below, their nationally determined contributions do have to be increased. Traditional owner Patsy Evans wants those with the power to make change to consider what's happening on her country. Go out and see what's happening. That's Go out there and be aware and look at it and don't make decisions where you are.
During 30 years managing mango farms outside Darwin, Martina Matzner has watched climate change increasingly threaten the Northern Territory's most valuable horticulture industry, worth $110 million a year. Certainly rainfall is declining as a trend. Prediction of temperature is becoming increasingly more difficult. Without cool nights, the trees won't flower and fruit. So the industry is working with the NT government to trial more climate change tolerant varieties. They need to be heat resistant, also obviously um, and withstand uh, variability of, of, um, of temperature. At the moment, the mango industry and the Northern Territory government are modelling the expected climate changes to 2090. At this stage, they're feeling confident that they'll be able to innovate to keep up with those. But we're really, really at the beginning of, of that whole journey, so not, not quite there yet. Coral along the NT coast has been bleached by sea temperature spikes three times since 2002. Scientists fear losing these corals altogether before they've been fully documented. So we don't, do not know what are the uh, temperature thresholds, for example, before they get stressed. They're hoping trials of reseeding techniques being used on damaged Queensland reefs could be used to regenerate NT populations. But if the sea warms permanently by two degrees, corals won't survive. These techniques must be used hand in hand with reduction of carbon emissions to give the reef the best chance. Yeah, so over here we've got snappers from the offshore snapper fishery. Yeah. Rick Buckworth has spent his career yeah, providing advice on how to manage risks including climate change in top end fisheries. He expects the fishing industries will be able to keep responding to good and poor seasons by varying their catches for a while. But he thinks stronger droughts and cyclones will eventually cause severe damage to fish stocks. There is a risk where you have those extreme events, the, the, the dry years and runs of dry years, that there will be massive impacts on the prawn fishery. Yeah. Scientists studying top-end sea level rise of 20 centimetres already this century have found some ecosystems have coped. Of all tropical plant species, mangroves display some of the most remarkable abilities to adapt. Here in Darwin Harbour, they've shown that they can literally march up the mudflats ahead of sea level rise. They are shifting it to this large degree because of um, these climate change influences. It, it is, um, you know, a bit of a, a warning to us. Top-end governments have started building defences to protect against sea level rise and storm surge, including these rock walls in Darwin. But the NT government is still approving new seaside suburbs in places projected to be inundated within 30 years. Maybe we should be planning for a higher level of inundation and therefore not planning to build in those areas. Governments are being urged to factor climate change into all decisions about what assets should be built and protected long term. Because if you're going to invest that much money, do you want to be coming back in 10, 15 years time to retrofit things? And, and retrofitting after the fact is always more expensive. The insurance industry is also arguing it makes economic sense. Mitigation does a lot more than just protect an individual property or, or a street. It protects businesses. It protects the uh, the economic activity that's going on in the town. I think you know what is going to happen. Under well, she's working hard to adapt. Mango grower Martina Matzner knows only global efforts to stop carbon emissions rising can save her industry long term. She's calling on all governments to do more to reduce them. Climate change is real. Um, I think um, it would be foolish not to be um, concerned about it. I think we just need to accept it as a start and then once we accept it then we can look at the solutions. Arnhem Land, 
The Mimal Rangers are on the front line of fighting bushfires, which are becoming more frequent due to climate warming and drought. It destroys half of the area's habitat for the animals. The rangers carry out these controlled burns in the early dry season to help prevent the spread of wildfires in the late dry and the release of millions of tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. Our government recognises that and measures that and um, everyone values that and, and they pay for that service. 27 top-end ranger groups earn $16 million, preventing more than a million tonnes of emissions each year and selling that as carbon credits to the federal government and big companies. But the rangers are accusing the federal government of keeping the price of carbon credits low by not requiring polluters to offset more emissions. There doesn't seem to be any clear policy mechanisms being put in place to drive it up. They've received a, pr a price under the Emissions Reduction Fund, which has clearly encouraged them to get on with these projects. The Commonwealth requires big greenhouse polluters to limit or offset some of their emissions increases. But scientists studying the effect of climate change in the top end believe both the federal and territory governments aren't doing enough to reduce emissions. They're also accusing both governments of preparing to dramatically increase emissions with the new onshore gas industry. Well, it's frankly an appalling policy. Um, emissions from those fossil fuel reserves will continue to contribute to the global problem. Our obligation to, to meet our international commitments is extremely important, we've got to do it, but what we shouldn't do is trash the economy, is undermine important industries in the process of doing that. The gas industry is arguing replacing the burning of coal with gas could reduce global emissions. Natural gas-fired power generates approximately half of the carbon emissions of coal-fired power. The CSIRO backs the gas industry's view. That's even though some of its own research has found no evidence that coal is being replaced by gas in Australia's customer countries. And it's found any environmental benefits could be reversed if gas fields are developed instead of renewable energy projects. As uh, battery technology and other storage uh, technologies mature, um, there will, we will see that transition. Uh, but over the next five to ten years, uh, it, that's when uh, natural gas has that role to play. The Territory Government promised all of the gas fracking industry's emissions would be offset. But the industry is pushing instead to be brought under the less stringent federal scheme. We have a number of years until we see uh, the production of onshore oil and gas, so we have some time on our hands uh, to work through these issues. The Territory Government is arguing it's reducing emissions by encouraging renewable projects, but the push to solar has been driven by private companies. We're doing it because it makes good environmental sense and makes good business sense. Darwin Airport generates a third of its own electricity from its solar farm, but it's plan to build a large battery here and supply power into Darwin homes have been delayed by negotiations with the NT government owned power company about the conditions for getting access to feed into the grid. You won't be surprised if I say I wish that they could do it faster because we're ready to go. With governments adamant they're doing enough, those fighting climate change effects are expecting no respite. All these things sort of point to tougher fire seasons, so the potential for those hotter late season wildfires is much higher. There's no simple solution, unfortunately.